The Shinatum people have called these lands where we are gathering home for thousands of years. And more recently, the Anunnaki and the Haudenosaunee have been sharing this land as one dish, one spoon treaty territory. We would like to acknowledge the enduring resilience of First Nations, Métis, and Inuit people who called this territory home. My name is Diane Tomlinson, and I work at the Odro Hayegwe Early On Center at Niagara Regional Native Center. I am so grateful to the Niagara Falls Public Library for joining us today to honor this special day, Orange Shirt Day. This day first started in probably 2013, and it was to honor one girl who is now a woman. When she was young, she was herself Phyllis. She was herself a resident at um, one of the residential schools. We, most of us have heard about the history of the residential schools, and she was so excited that her grandmother bought her a beautiful new orange shirt to wear. Sadly, when she got there, it was taken away from her and she never got to see it or wear it again. This day is one that I hope everybody can take a few moments to hear stories, to share stories, to listen to people. And if all Canadians can become more familiar with the residential schools and the histories of it, then we would all be a better country. Today I'm going to read a story. It's a children's story that is also very good for adults to hear. It's called When I Was Eight, and it's by Christy Morgan for Jordan Fenton and Margaret Pokiat Fenton, and the art is by Gabriel Grimard, and it's by Anna Press. Thank them for letting us read this today and share it with you. I knew many things when I was eight. I knew how to keep the sled dogs quiet while father snuck up on caribou and to bring the team to him after a kill. I knew the sun slept in the winter and it woke in the summer. And I knew that when the sun warmed Arctic Ocean, shrugged off its slumbering ice, we would cross it to trade furs with the outsiders. But I did not know how to read the outsiders' books. I was, it was not enough to hear them from my older sister, Rosie. I longed to read them for myself. Although I begged like a hungry dog after scraps, father would not let me go to the outsider's school like Rosie. He knew things about the school that I did not, but my name is Oliman, the stubborn stone that sharpens the half-moon ulu knife used by our women. I wore away at him all through the winter, and when the sun awoke again and we traveled to trade with the outsiders, he reluctantly left me at their school. A black cloaked nun cut my hair. I felt naked as my braids fell to the floor. Stripped of my warm parka, I was made to wear a thin pinafore and scratchy underwear with stockings that were too small to stay above my knees. My Inuit name was taken away from me and I was to be called Margaret. All I had left was a beautiful book my sister read me about a girl named Alice. I hugged it to my chest and I tried to be brave like the girl in the story. Every day for weeks we woke, very, very early for chores. Instead of sitting in desks, we scrubbed the floor beneath them. We washed walls and dishes and laundry, and then we went to church and kneeled on our already aching knees to clean our souls. I worked hard, but it brought me no closer to being able to read. When the first skiff of snow returned and my hopes were nearly dead, the kindly nun led us to a classroom and told us to be seated. At last, we were going to read. Behind the teacher's desk sat the nun who had cut my hair. I didn't want her for a teacher, but I sat very tall so she would know I was eager. A few older girls raised their hands, so I did too. The nun laughed 
and she motioned for me to stand and read. Read? I couldn't even speak English. I scowled at her as the others giggled. Instead of learning to read that day, I spent the rest of the class with my nose in the corner and my stocking slouched around my ankles. The nun constantly gave me extra chores as part of my education, she said. But though my muscles ached from the hard work and I could barely keep my eyes open, she could not wear out my determination. I used every task as an opportunity to learn new words. I studied each letter of the alphabet before wiping it from the board. I looked at the labels on cleaning supplies and I sounded out the words. I even studied the writing beneath pictures in the halls. These things improve my reading, but I long to read an actual book, my book. One evening, I hurried through my supper of cabbage soup, planning a hasty escape. I couldn't wait any more. I dashed into the hall, but the nun was waiting for me. Not so fast, Margaret. There are pots to be scrubbed, she said in a threatening tone, and she marched me to the kitchen. With my arms and scalding water up to my elbows, I couldn't hold back my frustration. I could be reading, I muttered. What? the nun demanded, her shoes creaking as she crossed the kitchen. She pinned me against the sink. Slowly, a smile spread across her thin lips. Fetch me a cabbage from the basement, she ordered. I'd heard stories of children who disappeared down in that dark cavern. I descended each step deliberately, hiding my fear. My hands quickly found a cabbage in the shadows and I scurried up the stairs but she slammed the door, shutting out all light. I pulled the handle. I was locked. A scream built in my chest, but I held it in. I closed my eyes, pulled up my stockings, and breathed deeply until I could feel my father's presence. He wrapped his arms around me in the darkness, and I spelled out my intimate name to him, whispering, Oh, L E M A U N. His proud smile made me stronger, so I worked through the name of my distant home. B A N K S I S L A N D. I spelled many things from home, and I was starting on the title of my book, A L I, when the door opened. I squeezed past the nun and I returned to the sink. Her angry black eyes raised goosebumps on the back of my shaved neck, but she could not make me cry. When I returned to the dorm room that night, all the girls were giddy. Everyone had beautiful new dark stockings. I pulled off my old ones, took my place in front of the nun and held out my hands and I closed my eyes. The nun crackled loudly as she handed me my pair. Laughter instantly filled the room. They're, they're red, I stampered in disbelief. Only circus clowns wore red stockings. I ran to my bed and I opened my book. I stared at the letters, holding back my tears until those letters became words, which grew into a familiar story. I could almost hear my sister's voice reading about the cruel queen, and I let the story carry me far away from the laughter. The next morning, I crept quietly to breakfast, but older girls saw me and called out, fatty legs, as bits of food fell from her mouth. Fatty face, I shouted back, F-A-T-T. -T. The nun swooped in. If you cannot get along with the others, you can tend to the laundry, she hissed. I entered the laundry and stood beside the large vat with the fire crackling beneath it. And then the idea came to me. I knew what to do with my stockings. 
I burned them to ashes. I felt like Alice after a bite of magic cake as large as the entire room. When the nun saw my bare legs, she exploded. Margaret, put on your stockings, she demanded. I set my jaw and across my arms. I can't. Why not? I just can't. Her face grew very red and she ordered everyone to search the room. Like the Queen's henchmen in my book, they scurried around, upturning everything. Books were torn from shelves and blankets from beds. No one was calling me fatty legs now and no amount of searching would ever bring those stockings back. The nun snarled when I was allowed another pair. In my new thick gray stockings, I felt victorious. But when I strode into class the next day, the nun slammed a book on my desk. It was a green reader like the older girls used. Page 34, she said. She wanted to cut me down to size. I opened the book. Nervousness swelled in my throat. I looked at the words and began slowly twisting my tongue around the consonants and forming my mouth around the vowels. By the second paragraph, I confidently sliced through the words without a single moment of hesitation. There was no stopping me. When I finished, I looked up, but the nun was facing the blackboard. Sit down, Margaret, she said. I felt a great happiness inside that I dared not show. I quietly took my seat. I was Olamon, conqueror of evil, reader of books. I was a girl who traveled to a strange and faraway land to stand against a tyrant, like Alice. And like Alice, I was brave, clever, and as unyielding as the strong stone that sharpens Anulu. I finally knew this like I knew many things, because now I could read. Thank you for joining in today and listening to this story. I hope that possibly you can maybe recommend this story to somebody else, to a friend, to somebody who might enjoy it as well. And it's such a kind, um, heartfelt way to learn about this part of our history the residential schools and what and how life would have been for an eight-year-old child. So thank you very much for turning in this app today. And uh, thank you. Miigwetch, miigwetch, miigwetch.